Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Ideas in Motion. We're joined today by Dorka Museb, a super talented and very ambitious um, uh, New York-based freelance animator and designer. Uh, she's worked at all the studios in the city. She's very long list of a pedigree that is very admirable, to be honest. Uh, before we bring her on to talk today about diversity and the art of community building, we're going to show a little bit of her previous work and then have us join us on stage. It's all original. 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 You never seen it like this. I got something you don't wanna miss. The best part, I got you on the list. All access pass on the wrist. It's all original. It's all what? It's all original. It's all what? It's all original. It's all what? It's all original. Styling like a trend. Show. Hi, thank you for having me. Of course, of course. It's going to be a really fun conversation today. You are versed with a very unique uh, background and skill set, which I'm very excited to chat about. Um, so I guess we can kick it off from there. I guess what's, you know, what's your origin? How did you get into art? Um, you know, when did you say, oh, I love art for my life? How long is this podcast? <laughs> 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 I mean, we're going to do a history of... So uh, it takes at least three maps and a lot of motion. So no, I I was, <laughs> I would say I'm uh, half Dominican, half Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. You know, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, but I have a lot of uh, Dominican heritage as well. And so I I guess growing up in a space a little bit different with a different last name as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like you know, uh, it, you you get to think differently. And I always was sort of partial to drawing since I was a kid. Um, never did I imagine, you know, that I would go this far. Obviously, I come from a very, very rural area in Puerto Rico, you know, very. And so I ended up uh, in my teens coming here to the United States, and I've been on my own since I was 18. Okay. <laughs> so, did, so you came by yourself from jump? No, my parents were here and then they left. Uh, they went back, they retired and went back, and so I stayed, and so I've been, yeah, I've been by my, by myself, <laughs> pretty much. And then after that, uh, I sort of slowly started uh, going into, or I was supposed to be going for biology, and. I love it. I was gonna be a, um, I was gonna be a surgeon originally. Listen, yeah. I got to that anatomy class. It was the anatomy class, it's wasn't anatomy it? Class. <laughs> it's anatomy class, like, no, no, not for me. <laughs> and I still had to take anatomy, I mean, obviously for drawing, yeah. but it is a hefty, anatomy, I mean, anybody, if you're a nurse, if you're, hey, just, Amazing because I I couldn't do it. I took kudos to anybody who passes those classes, and that was the first class. There was two, <laughs> so I, I quickly realized this isn't for me, and I ended up uh, going for graphic design first uh, at the at the at the community college where, where I was at, which is Madison, New Jersey. And then after that, I decided to go for um, for art school in New York City, and I was like, why not? And yeah. 
ended up going to the School of Visual Arts in 2003 and graduated in 2006. Mm -hmm. Ah, School of Visual Arts like that. Yeah, yeah represent. <laughs> represent. Yeah, and uh, I actually um, was one of the first classes from motion graphics to, because they had a motion graphics program that were one of the first ones. I want to say it was one of the first ones. Yeah. Um, and so it was really great to, uh, I, I was studying graphic design and then I saw motion graphics and I had already started using Flash back then. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> Action Script 2, baby. That's what's up. Yep. Action uh -huh. Script 2. Oh my God. That was actually my, my origin story also was in, uh, I started as a video game developer uh, for Action Script. You know, little Flash games you used to play in class when you're supposed mm -hmm. to be paying attention? Yeah. Oh. Very aware. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, I, I didn't realize that School of Visual Arts had a motion graphics program until, uh, you know, one of the teachers came in and started showing us like this is, you know, motion graphics and I, oh my God, this is what I've been wanting to do and that's, that's when I really um, sort of started going in that direction. It took me a few years to, you know, get an actual job because this was shortly after 2008 happened, you know. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a painful time. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Do you remember the exact piece of work that you saw when you said, like when your eyes just got big and you said that, I want to do that? You know, yeah, it was actually a couple of years after I had been already working and that was a Bugs piece uh, for Goodreads. Oh. A classic. Yeah, classic. Everybody knows that piece. Uh -huh. And everybody knows. Yeah, it yeah. blew my mind because I was like, oh my God, that is so beautifully done. And it's, I still... To this day, I'll, you know, shout out to Buck for that piece. It's just, I still go back to it. I still look at it. I still study it. Um, I was fascinated. I was absolutely fascinated to, uh, you know, see that in, so beautifully done and uh, and see if I was able to do something like that. So I started um, around that time sort of looking for uh, ways to express in that, in sort of that direction. In that world. So, okay, uh, is that how you ended up going into television? Yeah, so, you know, when motion graphics first started, there was a lot of television work. It was a lot of broadcast work. Uh, it wasn't specifically something that I, I wanted to do sure. uh -huh. so much as those were the jobs were. So hey, it was like... I ended up at VH1. That was, that was how. It was, I graduated in 09 and I said... Who's got money? Yeah, job, basically, job, I yeah. mean, if you also, you've done the Viacom rundown. <laughs> oh, yeah. Once you're in Viacom, you just kind of swirk, circle around, you change channels, which just means a different button in the elevator. and. Pretty much. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it, it was it was interesting uh, that this is where it started. But I also started at Comedy Central, which was, uh, it's probably why I ended up doing so much collage later on, because in at Comedy Central, we had a sort of, uh, it wasn't specifically just photography or just video. There was a lot of mixtures of things. Like uh, if you look at the work that was done at that era between, you know, this is when they changed their branding as well. Mm -hmm. There was a ton of collage going on in that time between, uh, I would say, yeah, 2006, 2008, 2012, around that era. And there was a lot of collaging going on, a lot of fun stuff, a lot of, um, what's that script that goes the boing, boing, boing? Uh... <laughs> Another script. Yeah, um, inertial bounce. Yes, the inertial yes. bounce script was reign supreme. Yep, yep. I to this day, I have that page bookmarked, and I know that there's only two parameters in the script that I need to worry about to get it to move just the way I want it to move. Yeah. Yeah, you couldn't like go all crazy, but you know, it was just it was just fun. It was a lot of fun. The com con the content at Comedy Central was very fun to work at to work with. You know, at that time, I think. Um, you had anywhere from like Colbert uh, and and, uh, and and John Stewart, and then you also had South Park there and other animated shows that were there at the time. Which, like I said, it was you could be thrown into something that was very illustrative, um, or something that was very like brand related. Um, I remember working a little bit in the Key and Peel when they first came out, and like how that developed because it was internally developed as well. I think our friend Brandon ended, mm -hmm, up, mm -hmm. ended up doing the yeah. branding shout for out, that. Shout yeah, out to shout Brandon out to Campbell. Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about him. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it just seemed like there was just so such a diverse uh, skill set to have 
uh, which I'm really thankful for. And you really, I got introduced to 3D there as, as well because they were also doing a lot of 3D work. So it was kind of like everything goes. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, you know, today we're, we're chatting about diversity, right? And so from a very, I guess, early start in your career, you were already thrown into a diverse type of work across all skill sets, right? Which is the thing that, you know, I kind of get asked that a lot uh, from, you know, young grads and all that. They're like, oh, I'm really good at this one thing and this is all I want to do. How do I do that? And I'm always kind of like, eh, I mean, yeah, you can be really awesome at one thing, but there's so much to be gained from just saying yes to anything they throw on your plate and yeah. then just learning and trying it out. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. I do feel like when, you know, here's what I think about it. There's, 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 uh, there's value in, in, in being specific about your skill set and like focusing on one thing. I do feel, for my part, that I've learned that by exploring another venue, mm -hmm. it makes that specific thing that I want to do a little bit stronger and because better. you're looking mm -hmm. at it from a different perspective. Yes, it makes it better. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't explore other things. I encourage anybody who, if you like doing uh, a certain thing, go to do 3D for a minute and then that will inform so much of what you do with that one specific thing. And like, it's sort of a great way of like adding to your sort of um, I am missing out words today, but <laughs> <laughs> adding uh, to your, your to your repertoire. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and I think that um, exploring and examining that it really wasn't until about I want to say about 2013, 2014 that I really started seeing more community driven things at the beginning of. Uh, I mean, motionographer has been there for a really long time, yeah, right? Yeah, very Which long time. I mean, like OG, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Shout out Justin Cohn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ju yeah, Justin Cohn. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that um, it, it was the one place, and then there was other, like, smaller spaces where you could go in and ask questions, but it was very toss-up. You will either get called a noob or, like... <laughs> <laughs> You don't know how to do that. And so it was just, yeah, like what's what's wrong with you? Yeah, right. Uh, and so uh, I relied more on the people around me. I don't. I don't know if that. I don't know if that's changed. I'm pretty sure you can still post on some job boards or some general community boards, and you will still get trolled. This is true. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're a tough crowd. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's like the best crowd, but also a tough crowd. I just, yeah. I imagine that most of us are just like you know that guy that chews gum and is unimpressed all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what I figure. Yeah, we all sit there and we're just like, ah, uh, nah, uh, like, nah, not that nah, cool. Yeah, it's yeah. all right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on the inside, we're like crippling fear of like, I wish I could do that. Oh my God, <laughs> that animation is so good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> God damn it, how old are you again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're um, already there, it took me years. Literally, you're like, you're 11. What's wrong? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, another interesting kind of part of this, you know, diversity in, in the type of work and the... the the techniques and the mediums. You've been freelance, it seems, your, most of your career, correct? I have, and I, I think for the most part, yes. Um, it's, I, at the beginning it was permanence. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, uh, well, we went the best of both worlds. You get paid freelance money and you get the study. Mm -hmm. um, so it was permanence at the beginning, and then a little bit after, I think after Patriot Act, I would say that, I started sort of freelancing for real, for real, where I was going from one studio to the next, to the next, to the next, and sort of working on short-term projects or like being a month here and a month there. It took me a while to uh, get the hang of that. I, again, this community, I think after, I would say, yeah, 2013, 2014, the community sort of started getting a little bit more welcoming, more open, and started teaching each other more things. I mean, the OG video co-pilot, of course. Of course, <laughs> Andrew Craver. Yeah, we all learned how to animate a flare. Yes, yeah. if, I mean, JJ Abrams will hire us all. Forever and ever. <laughs> Base level 101. There's a, the famous Juan Chuckle, which we need to come up with a camera for because it comes up every so often. It's great, yeah. but <laughs> it, like I think that he opened up that door and so people started getting a little bit friendlier in terms of like what the content was and wanting to teach you know, others. Um, and then School of Motion came in to the mix and uh, Joey Carman. Hi, Joey. Mm. Um, who did his 30 days of motion, uh, you know, After Effects, et cetera, and started um, sort of doing these classes. And I think that's when I really started sort of being more aware of a community being built, of a community being here. And 
through School of Motion that I found Panimation and I found a lot of other friends and um, that I'm still friends with today. Uh, we still talk and uh, help each other out. You know, uh, I think that being, I think animation per se, it's something that has to be collaborative. I think that before it was a matter of like, I'm going to do this on my own and look at all of that I did. But knowing that that leads to burnout and mm -hmm. like making it more collaborative, open people up to being able to bring in like new generations of people, other ideas, collaborating with others. I think it's been a little bit more open since. And I'm very thankful, I for one, I'm very thankful to, to that it is that way. Yeah, to have, to have the overlap of everything, right? And it's kind of cool because it's, it's almost like the whole world and 2020 only exasperated this. But as a freelancer, you know, you are, you are used to always having to be the new kid on the block. You go for a week, you go for a month, and then you move and you walk into an entirely new pool of that microcosm of community, right? Yeah. Like one thing is the online world, but even even if going from one studio or one network or, you know, totally different set of rules every time you walked in there, right? And yeah. and, and, and it's the unspoken rules, which are the hard ones to, to get by, right? It's not the rule of, oh, are you a good animator? Are, like, it has nothing to do with that. It ends up being like, all right, is this a bro circle? Cool. Mm -hmm. Or like, oh, okay, they're all ladies. Sweet. How do I interface? You know, <laughs> like, it, it's it's or is it a mix? Or is you know, is it all people of color? Is it all you know, heavily slanted? Different genders. Yeah. You know, different. Yeah, mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you know, I I do have sort of a personality that is more uh, not as intro. I'm extroverted. You know, so obviously I'm I'm gonna come in and be like, hey. Yeah. Uh, which was not always welcome. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's fine. And this place is not for me. And this is the reason why I'm a freelancer. And I'll be here a few weeks and then I'm gone with my merry way. Yeah, so yeah. that's the one advantage of freelancing is that you get to experience. <laughs> Do good work, get paid, and I'm out. Yeah. Bye. Uh -huh. uh, but also, it's, it's, just, um, it's also a good way to test out what kind of environment do you like to be in. Um, I do I do appreciate a lot be having been permanent at the beginning because it was kind of like being staff and because it was kind of like being staff I did get a good setup and a good base on how to be how to work within a team what was my strength what was my weaknesses what do I need what do I need to improve uh, collaboration with others so I did get a good base and then from there I would know like okay um, you know, walking into a new environment, how do they, I knew what questions to ask and I knew more or less how to go about it. Um, I've not had a lot of like terrible experiences. You know, I've usually, studios are very welcoming and, and, and by now when you walk into a studio, um, they have everything set up. It's like, here you go, we're onboarding you. They either send it to you a couple of days before uh -huh. or they give you the first day to just sort of get acquainted with everything. It's very seldom do I get thrown in, you know, to something unless it's like, we need someone at ASAP. <laughs> yeah, which happens often, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a, I think uh, there's also some, something said for energy around that. So myself, I have, it's a double-edged sword. I'm known for being the guy that you call when everything's on fire and I just drop in and fix it and it's great. But he comes in with the extinguisher. <laughs> yeah, no, literally. I'm like, hi all. So I'm here. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm here now. So what are we doing? You know? Yeah. So it's it's an interesting thing to 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 think about how like you can draw and place yourself into those things. We were talking a little bit before the show about how like um, you know, like uh, all boys Catholic school or like, you know, all girls school and like, like all dude studios have to, tends to be more disorganized. And I'm very much guilty of this, you know, and it's just, I find that all fascinating to be like, yeah, you totally draw the energy sometimes. So yeah, I think forth. the energy uh, is different energy every time that you go into a space and it depends on, like, I feel like having had all of these uh, sort of experiences, I will tell you that the person who either the owner of the studio or the creative directors are the ones that set the tone for the rest of the studio. Mm -hmm. They set the tone and I have seen spaces that are very welcoming and very effective and very, um, yeah, I, I think every space that I've walked into has had incredible, uh, incredible vibes 
one way or the other. Mm-hmm. You can, you can. <laughs> How's that? Incredible vibes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is your vibe is incredible. Yeah. Um, and, and, and some of those vibes are, are amazing and some of them are not for me, but that's okay because I know that I'm going to gonna be out. So, um, How do you feel that translates into the digital space? You know? Yeah, you know, um, if anything with the pandemic is sort of made it a little bit easier for me um, to to be able to uh, walk into, not walk into spaces, but not literally walk into spaces, <laughs> but um, you know what was really exciting was oh, I got to work with people that I would have never worked with. You know, I got to work, there was one particular space uh, when I worked at Golden Wolf that was so much fun because a person, one person was in Paris, the other one was in Canada, I was in New York, so it was, it, it was working with people that I would have never had the opportunity. Same thing with Neon Zoo when we did the poem uh, not too long ago, uh, the animated poem. It was people that were in Israel, there were people that were in all parts of the world. So it, that's the one thing that, if, if anything, increased my point of view, weirdly enough, even though we were stuck at home, it was still, I was still able to see so many other artists from all over the world that were coming together and like uh, that I would have never been able to to be a part of the to, or to to have met even um, has had it not been for that digital space. Yeah, it's that's a that's a great point because before you had to go to the studio to sit next to the person physically, right? Yes. And that was how you interface with your people. And maybe, oh, maybe they're from Brazil mm-hmm. or maybe they're from somewhere else. And But you had to be there and also was very frowned upon to work from home, even though I'm sure you can relate, but the, I used to be so frustrated when they would bring me in and sit me down on a computer that was like six years old, had four versions ago of software <laughs> and was missing all my plugins. And I'd be like, oh, no, I could work, I could, I, on your machine, it's gonna take me a week. On my machine, I could do this in a day. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's it's that definitely um, has been interesting. I mean, I, there's other spaces that I'm still using their computers because we will log in through and some virtual. So, yeah, mm-hmm. some sort of virtual thing. Um, so I'm still using some of those things. <laughs> <laughs> and we, won't, we won't mention names. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are. Yeah. Um, no, actually, it was. It's been fine. It's been great. Like I, I think it's really interesting how we've gotten around that and how we've gotten around working virtually in such a way. And I think it's been really interesting. Uh, and it's opened up studios again. It's opened up studios. What I do feel a little bit bad about is the newer people that are coming in. Mm-hmm. I'm really, really benefit from being live and in person next to you. That early, especially in the early stages of the career where it's like, I've never navigated a file server of a studio before. Uh, at home, I just move a folder and nothing happens, but you move a folder in a studio server and you're dead. Like, yeah. <laughs> home of the folder. Literally, everybody <laughs> panics. Everybody on Slack. <laughs> Everybody panics and they're like, you broke everything. Yeah. You see this lag go like multiple people are typing. Yeah, yeah. the badge just starts <laughs> pinging. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, um, one solution that I saw, and I saw this in uh, the studio when I was in Sarovsky, there was a an intern, well, an intern that had they had hired. And I think uh, it was very difficult for her because she had been, you know, it was, mm-hmm. she came in as an intern in 2020. And so um, literally in the pandemic, just graduating, how do I learn about this? And she gave me an idea that I think it's fantastic if anybody has an intern and like wants to try this, if they're virtual or it's somewhere else, they would share, like the a senior person will share the screen and the intern will watch the person uh, work. And if you wanted to ask, if they wanted to ask a question, they could. And if they wanted to just watch how you put keyframes down and how you handle the files and where everything goes, then they could do that. And uh, it was immensely helpful to the intern to just watch the senior person put their keyframes down and see how they went about doing their easing and et cetera, and why certain things looked the way they did and how they organized their things. So it was very, uh, I think it's, it's, the newish way of doing things, like sharing your screen, sort of like a stream that we're doing now, or like sure. a stream. Right there. Hi, Hi. Matt. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think that was, that's a great a great way, and um, and I think there's even some people that are doing that in um, Twitch. Mm-hmm. 
that are just going on Twitch and animating and uh, that you can that you can watch. Well, and there's also there's this whole like subset of um, I'm blanking on her name right now. Uh, there was a woman, a young woman that got into digital fashion. She knew nothing about it. And so she started live streaming her journey literally from day one of watch me learn how to do digital fashion. <laughs> and fast forward a year later, and now she's been all over the world. She just had a giant actual runway show. Um, nice. I think it was in Beijing, maybe. Um, don't quote me on that internet. Um, but if you Google you know, digital fashion Twitch streamer, you'll find that there's this new pattern of people who now, you, I mean, they find it interesting, like you learn with them at mm -hmm. the same speed that they're learning. So it's kind of like this meta version of like, I also don't know what I'm doing, but I'm gonna get something from also the other person that doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. And maybe then together we kind of can figure this out. Yeah, yeah and I think um, I think another way of doing things is ask uh, just asking people to mentor. You know, uh, there's, there's a lot of that right now. Mentoring, mentorships are, just incredible like for me i wish that i had a mentor you know some sort of mentorship when i was first starting out and i think a lot you know what's really funny a lot of the questions that we get as mentors or like what have been in mentorship space has more to do with freelancing than it does about the art yeah it has more to it's do the with business side. It's the business side mm -hmm. and um i always and again another shout out if you don't mind to motion hatch who's uh incredible and mm -hmm. she is constantly throwing you know having she deals a lot with the side of business and so she goes in and she uh has a podcast and interviews people like that's how i learn more or less and asking the questions there and uh, not being shy about asking, asking questions even if there's that you know, unimpressed guy on the other side <laughs> there's plenty of us that will help <laughs> Even if you get a sad face the first time, <laughs> there might be a happy face in the next room over. Yes. Yeah. Just keep trying. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's uh, it's very true. And, and I mean, that's, that's a whole other topic of just like the, the balance of how do you stay an artist and do work that you're happy with and the type of work you want to be doing. Yeah. And you have to weigh that with the very real, you know, side of life of, Eventually, you don't live at home. Eventually, you get you know your rent to pay and health insurance, and you know well depending on what country you're in. But um, you know the life catches up, and then mm -hmm. you have to start choosing. At some point, you kind of have to make the decision of I'm gonna take this project because it's good for me, mm -hmm. like my soul, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna take this project because it provides me a certain level of comfort. Yeah, I think. Um I've found a balance of that nature as well of like, okay, I'm gonna work on this to, you know, uh, ensure that I have a roof over my head, but then other things I'm doing, one of the projects I'm working on right now, it's not paying me as much, it's fine. Because it's a project that I feel is important mm -hmm. and- uh, Like it needs to be made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it needs to be made and I'm animating a dragon. Of course I'm gonna say yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. course I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> Yeah. You want me to animate a dragon? Yes. You're like, this sounds amazing. Yes. Yeah. Please. So, uh, yeah. I, think... I love working nightmares. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do the flames. No, I, I think it's, 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 a, it's a balance. And I think, but it's a balance that, that gets, I think as you go along and as you, as you grow more and as you get more experience, I think it's a balance that you'll learn to have. Um, but I do think it's, it's important to, uh, to be a part of the community. Um, and, you know, um, and I wanna address the introverts in the room. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I do get a lot of like, oh, I'm more introverted and I don't know about this. And it's like, I had friends that were introverted and it's like, whatever time you can spare, if you, if, you know, you wanna have a before and an after. So ensuring that if you're going to participate in any community event, whether that is online or whatever it may be, um, that you give yourself time before and you give yourself time after, right? So I learned that from my introverted uh, friends mm -hmm. of like, they were still very much a part of the community and they still did, um, you know, your, your, um, your, your, your uh, point of view is very important. Uh, and, and some of us have louder voices, <laughs> I know, but it doesn't mean that we don't appreciate the, the, you know, other people that are more thoughtful about their words. Yeah. <laughs> 
and more shy about it. I just, I feel like you're just as much a part of the community and it's important for, um, for you to always also be here. But I learned that they need time. They need time before and they need time after. Before to get ready and after to unwind. Decompress. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, so. the, the, the social currency, you know, battery barge, and it Correct. reaches an end. You know. Yeah, and ensuring that you're protecting yourself first and at all times. And if it's entirely too much and it's entirely too much, you're mm -hmm. fine. You're still part of the community. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of... The, that's one also benefit of the online thing is that at least you don't have to, you know, hey, I mean, you know, you can just literally be like, what up? <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. You can just, you don't even have to be on camera. You can just sip your tea and be with your cat and it's fine. Yeah, yeah it's all good. <laughs> one hand on the cat and one hand on the friends. It's all exactly. good. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, community has been really important and I think it has been uh, pivotal to, to my career in many, many ways. And so... Um, you want to talk about animation now and like how the oh i would love to hear about that yeah that's yeah. so at some point you know you're participating in all these communities and you're you know finding your place and you know how loud or not loud you want to be in all these things and at some point you made the decision of i want to correct if i'm wrong but co-found a, a chapter of this community in new york yeah it wasn't so i wanted to talk about the community aspect of it with you i think this is mm -hmm. what we talked mm -hmm. about prior to the to the podcast, um, it happened very organically. I didn't wake up one day and said, I'm gonna be a panimator. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it happened very, very organically. Um, Emily Suvanvej, who uh, was in London at the time with me and Lynn and everybody, um, was coming to New York City. And so she was like, hey, anybody wants to get together? And so it was very, it was sort of organically founded. Um, we first got, <clears throat> we started out going to brunch with about seven people. And then um, I, I happened to organize it. I was like, sure, I'll find a place. And so found a lovely place. We had brunch. We, we enjoyed each other's company. And we were like, why don't we do this? Uh, why don't we start out with a Facebook messenger? Because back then it was Facebook mm -hmm. um, messenger. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there and we'll meet again every month. I was like, sure, I can, I can organize that, no problem. As I said, I'm, I'm not shy about, you know, contacting people, et cetera. And so the Facebook uh, sort of um, messenger group just started growing to the point where it was like, okay, this is entirely too much. To, yeah, because people started just telling one another, right? And at the beginning, and it just started, started growing from there more of like word of mouth because even not so long ago, about 10 years ago or so, uh, now Panimation has been around for like five or six years now, mm -hmm. at least the New York version. The mm -hmm. uh, London version started with B and Lynn and Hedvig in 2015 in London. But um, we started Panimation New York City in 2017. And so around that time, it was very, um, believe it or not, I would walk into a studio and it would be just I will be the sole female there, or mm -hmm. I will be the, the other gender, yeah. or the other, other, uh -huh. other. Other, 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 <laughs> yeah. other of whatever. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and so we I, I walked in, and, um, and once I started, sort of like Panimation started with the seven people, it, it was so enthusiastic. It was, oh, there's, wait, there's more of us? What do you mean? It's because we didn't know one another mm -hmm. because it was only one per studio. So when we, the, for the first year that we did this, I think the one thing that I would remember clearly was people saying, oh my God, I had no idea that there was this many people, different people in motion graphics. And so it was interesting to see that. And every month, it will be sort of like a shuffling of faces saying the same thing and mm -hmm. inviting one another. And I felt like there was a need for that to ensure that there was a connection. I, I am, if anything, I'm a very good connector of people. I, I've, that's one of the strengths I have. I, I know that I'm very good at being like, you need to meet this person over here and over there, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I found that that's one of my strengths. And so what, whereas like with Emily and, and, and eventually Irene who became an, and I mean, Irene is more like, uh, uh, you know, uh, introverted and so was Emily. And so they served another aspect of it of, of for Panimation. They were, they had the contacts, they had the ways. I, I remember, uh, Emily put a whole event together with, uh, Vimeo. Um, so there was, there was different aspects of 
other people. I, I definitely did not do this by myself and I could not have. You know, pairing with someone else was essential because uh, these other people took on things that I couldn't. And I was the loud voice in the room that I could ensure everybody was comfortable and come on everybody and hey, let's go. Uh, while behind the scenes, Irene and Emily were doing so much work. Yeah, they were, you know, <laughs> the, hard, the hard part, you know, where it's like, oh man, like having me try to reach out to people, we, have a, we share that similarity, I think. Um, uh, we're having to be the person that follows up on every email or maintains a database or whatever. You're just like, I'm falling asleep. I can't do it. Hey, wh who's got the party? Let's go. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Doing all of all of the. Uh, I mean, I remember Emily like took copious notes every time that we. I mean, she had everything like straight right there, and uh, and I said, like I said, she knew B, and so we sort of like form a, a really good friendship with B and Lynn and Hedvig and we continue because it felt like there was a need. There was a need there. And I think that if, if you know, from what I've said so far, right, if you are going to form your own community, and I think your friend and I spoke about this mm -hmm. when, uh, I, I'm blanking on the name, mm -hmm. but um, if whatever community you're going to do, respond to what people are telling you. So if, I responded to people telling me we need to do this every month. And I said, sure, sure let's do it. Um, I think a little bit after a while, there was another need that arose of uh, maybe we don't need to do this every month anymore because people already know each other enough and now we're going to do it quarterly and now we're going to do events. And so it is a matter of learning and knowing what people uh, want to do and keeping it very open. So there was never any fear of people coming up to me and saying, why don't we do a museum trip? Why don't we do a picnic? Which was one of the most successful ones, is the picnic was at Who doesn't love a picnic? Yeah. Oh, we had huh. such a great time. And then we, we should do it again. Okay, let's do it again. So it's just, and that, the picnic idea came from another member uh, who is not an admin and, uh, uh, museum trips came from our young, some of our younger people and the, you know, junior people that were coming in. Uh, screenings. It, people wanted eventually to collaborate and cooperate. It, that's what it means to have a community. It doesn't mean that I get to dictate what everybody does or I get to pick and choose. People will approach me and be like, I want to do a screening. Sure, I'll make sure that people are there. I'll make sure that I announce it. Like I said, I have the loudest voice here because I'm just loud. <laughs> You need a loud person and you need like, you know, uh -huh. a, a balance. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'll ensure that I make the, you know, the, the little posters and the arrangements and make sure that people know that it's happening and we'll do whatever you want. So that's how the community was built. It wasn't built, uh, it was built very organically and it was built mainly as me listening to what the community wanted to do versus me dictating what we should or should not be doing. Well, it's, it's, it's pretty cool too to hear that because that means that the original, I guess, hook, the reason that someone would tell someone else about it was just because this is cool, there's other people like me. Yeah. Right? Like at the core, it was just that like, wait, there's more of me, cool. Yeah. You know, and then that led into, I guess, sort of like the plans of, oh, well then now that there's a lot of us, we kind of just don't want to hang out. Yeah. We kind of just want to like have a reason to like have a drink and like chill in the park. So let's go up to have a picnic. Yeah. I know that yeah. people like, I know Andrea Smith, for example, started doing, um, uh, she, I think she started in 2017 or 2018. She started doing, uh, things took a turn, which is, uh, and it was born out of like, Oh, do you think we should do it? Yeah. Do it and see if the panimators want to, um, you know, uh, collaborate with you on this and she's still doing it um it's short films and um and i think she's doing a, a fantastic job of that and getting them screened and she's doing short films herself now that i think are getting uh, awards so it to see not only like the community being built but also see it grow and see the people in it do so well you know it's been amazing uh it's been fantastic one of the best things that i've seen the community do is like as i mentioned before even as close 
as 2017, 2018, we were still having one of us, whatever the other was in studio, and now we're getting each other, oh, you need to work with this person, or you need to work with that person, or you need to work at this studio or that studio, and uh, bringing each other into spaces and um, having a more diverse people in the space because we're recommending one another and we wanna work with one another. Um, it's been one of the, the things that I've seen that, that really makes my heart like sing because it's just beautiful to see. Yeah, it's, and I'm curious, do you feel that that's happening at all levels of the studio business? <laughs> no. Right? So, because here's the other, right, on the one side, awesome, great, we're all starting to now be the animators and the worker bees and there's more of us, that's wonderful. There's a large skew still in, um, you know, anyone with the executive title. Yeah, I think that's also changing depending on the studio. Mm -hmm. um, it's starting to change. I'm seeing things changing. You know, I'm seeing a lot of studios that are uh, female owned or women led or uh, other genders led yeah. um, and or yeah, shout it's out to Andor. Andor. <laughs> they actually they actually shot a music video in my previous studio ah, space. They're fantastic. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Andor, uh, Mighty Oak, mm -hmm. who's uh, around, you know, female owned um, and and queer and, uh, and and others. And so um, and there's also uh, you know Sarovsky, Erin Sarovsky mm -hmm. owns owns that space. And then there's also um, was another studio that I was oh Neon Zoo, who's Ellis Kelly who does a lot of documentaries and a lot of, um, I think she's more known for the Obama video of like, uh, but, uh, and she's done some incredible, incredible documentary work. And uh, we got nominated for an Emmy with her. Um, super proud of it. I got to go to the Emmys uh, here in New York, mm -hmm. the documentary Emmys, which was, it was fun. It was fun. I did my makeup and I looked like the hamburg hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I looked like a hamburger when I went. I was like, I had these ridiculous earrings and I had my makeup and I looked like a hamburger. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I it was just, fine. I'm oh, sure it was. It was, it was listen, <laughs> it was the people where it, it is what it is, okay? Let's just say that uh, <coughs> it was my red carpet moment, okay? <laughs> All that matters. All that matters. Yeah. We had fun, but it, it's it's incredible to get to work with people with, with these studios. However, there is still um, it, there's still work to be done. There's still definitely work to be done. And you know, I know Hornet, for example, has a lot of uh, female-led directors and um, other genders as well. Um, it's one of the studios that I see constantly, and. Uh, and I know Dash, for example, like Dash is, uh, I, I looked at their uh, Dash, Dash Bash, and I looked at the people who are coming in to, um, to speak at their Dash Bash, and it's, it's very varied and very different, uh, diverse backgrounds. So I'm really happy to see that, to see that representation and the effort to make, uh, some studios are making the effort, uh, still making the effort uh, from 2020, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> still making the effort of, um, of represent, you know, make sure that, people are represented and they do have diverse voices. But it's, there's still work to do, there's still work to do. Do you have any, I guess, um, thoughts on maybe tips or advice for, because one thing is when you're starting a new community, right? And you can kind of set the rules and to an extent, every community kind of like by definition starts exclusive in one way or another, right? It's, oh, we're all animators, cool. Well, if you're an illustrator, you might not really want to be part of that or jump in initially, right? But it's a lot easier to mold something when you're listening, especially if you're listening to what people ask for, to make it inclusive and diverse, right? Yeah. A lot of existing communities, it's like a Titanic. Any thoughts on how you might approach trying to shift kind of those tides within these larger pre-established um, situations? Um, as I said before, and I'll say it again, it begins with whoever is guiding the community. It basically, they set the tone for the community, right? And so I've been in communities where I, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I have no desire to be here. This is not made for me. You're not making it comfortable for me to be here. Um, and when, and I've heard multiple people have already, um, 
said to the admins, this is a problem and the admins aren't listening and nothing is being done, then there's very little that you can do other than abandon ship. Right, abandon ship. <laughs> to, to continue yeah. that. Become the internet's biggest troll. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it's very little. If, if the admins are not, are not willing to listen to the community. And I think that's, that's what I, and I, not to continue the two animations horn, but I'm going to um, it. it, it was, away. we love <laughs> animation. When we first started, um, actually the name itself was uh, genitalia related. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we, we heard people say, we're not joining this community because we don't feel like the name is a good name for us and we don't feel comfortable here. We listened and changed it. And so you don't feel comfortable, let's change that. Um, let's, uh, let, let's figure out a way for it. Like for me, it's more about if you're going to build a community, you want people to be comfortable there and want to be heard. And what I've experienced a lot actually um, is people being very afraid of telling an admin something or being critical or is bringing something to the table, especially people who are from marginalized communities, very, very scared because they don't know what the reaction is gonna be. And when they see that they have a voice, when they see that they're being listened to, it opens it up even more for them to be more comfortable and bring more ideas to the table. But that has to do with the people running it. And it's always, if you're running a community just to say, I have a community and it's all about this, then that's not, that's a community of one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then everybody in the community is gonna look like you and it's gonna be just like you. Well, great, you have a community of yourself. Yeah. If you want a community that is diverse, that has different people coming in with different ideas, and they're open and they're comfortable telling you something is wrong, then you need to listen. And that's always gonna be the person at the top running it. It always depends on who, it, who is. And I've been to communities where it's like, this isn't comfortable, and you're being told that people are not comfortable, and you're not doing anything about it, I'm gonna have to leave. Because at the end of the day, I have to protect myself, right? And I have to protect my mental health, and I have to protect uh, my exposure to certain things. Um, so unfortunately, you're not going to have me there. No, and, and it's also uh, interesting there, um, that thought that if specifically if you come from a marginalized group, the rest of your life has enough trauma to deal with <laughs> that like the last thing you need is to go get made fun of or whatever uh, on this yeah. new forum. And, and yeah. the crazy part is, um, I have several friends that are parents and they, they kind of half joke about how most of their job as a parent these days is just to like navigate their kids' social media and the exposure because there's no off switch, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you used to have to be at the studio to be a part of that community, like you said, you could go, not my vibe, I'm out, and you never have to think about them ever again. Now, there's a limitless entry points yeah. of essentially of abuse that can come from, yeah. um, you know, being in any of these situations. And so you might leave, but now that you were there and they set you up, you know, you don't know what anyone could be saying, trolling, etc. Yeah. And it's so hard. It is hard, but I think that also, <laughs> you've heard of the freelance grapevine. <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> that for you don't want to work there. Um, uh -huh. You don't want to be a part of that community. That's usually what happens when I when there's a community and there's problems in the community and the admins have been told and nothing's been done. Very quickly, do we hear you don't want to be a part of this community? Mm -hmm. You don't. If you do, just make sure that you know that this is what's happening within the community and know whether or not and make your decision as to whether or not you want to be there. But just fully know. So we tell each other, like what communities to avoid or if you want to be there just know that this is what you're going to have to deal with right because it's always your choice regardless isn't it so i'm not going to take the choice away from anybody to be like you want to join the community group go for it yeah go have fun yeah. have fun but know that this is what you may or may not be dealing with and this may or may not add more stress depending on where you are in your um in your own journey as well you know i feel like there's people who are not there in the journey. I think when, uh, yeah, it depends on where they are in the journey. I think when 2020 happened and we sort of had this shake up, uh, it was interesting to see <laughs> to see how the industry um, responded to it. 
it was it was interesting um and how we've now gone back to the norm right mm -hmm. and very few spaces are still advancing this this space uh, to be fair though to the industry as well there were, there were conversations that were being had internally as well and i think that not everybody needed to say things externally i think it was uh, how do i say this let me put my thoughts together for a minute yeah sure yeah i think um should we talk about 2020 <laughs> what are your can, thoughts we can we can we can dive into it if you'd like yeah <laughs> um, your thoughts while i gather mine yeah yeah i think um there's a there was a movement towards Everyone should be heard. Everyone should have a seat at the table. Everyone is equally valid. But I think totally my own subjective analysis yeah, of the situation your, your, yeah. is that that was driven because now everybody was equal and that we were all stuck at home mm. working from our own desk in our own house. Mm. So this interaction of having to sit next to someone that was different than you mm -hmm. and would question you face to face and tell you, ah, oh, it's not going to work or like, oh, I really don't like what you're wearing or, oh, we're just not the vibe. A lot of that disappeared, you know, right. it's, um, and now that we're coming back to a hybrid whatever world, but there's some face to face meetings, there's, you know, that part, the uncomfortable frictions of diverse groups of people having to coexist peacefully, mm -hmm. um, productively have started to rear their ugly head again. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to pinpoint you know, that's, that, I feel like that's a much larger conversation on like the personalities and humanity as a whole, right? Yeah. But within the creative industry specifically, I think that having to be forced back in the same room again kind of just resurfaces, kind of like falling back into old bad habits. Mm -hmm. And now the extrovert that looks a certain way or moves in the world a, a certain way can be, not that this is you, but can be like a louder voice. I feel right? a little called out. I know, <laughs> I'm like, joking. Oh I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm the same. I'm the loudest person I'm joking, always, I'm joking. And, um, we'll be loud together. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, but that, you know, it starts to once again, you know, a Slack badge, like you said, someone moved the folder, everybody's thing pings. Right. It's a hundred icons popping up and everyone's quote unquote equally as important in that moment. Right. Whereas in a room of 10 people, Whoever's the loudest is going to be heard. Right. Hmm. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about the comeback because honestly, I have not really come back to physically being in spaces. So for me, when I experienced it going back to 2020, and again, this is, I want to caveat the fact that this is my experience. I'm not speaking for any community specifically. I'm speaking as myself, Dorka Musa, animator. What I experienced was, um, it felt like things were unspoken at the beginning when everything started happening in June of 2020 and all the protests started coming up. It felt like it was ignored as much as possible by the industry. Now, I don't know whether it was being ignored or was it being spoken internally in studio, especially here in New York City. I heard a lot of people uh, because the protests were either close to their homes or everything that they were internally speaking on it. But on the surface level, on the sur um, what people were seeing, we weren't seeing uh, a lot of it being spoken about, you know, from the industry aloud. And then it felt that it went from being ignored to being... <laughs> Everybody has to put out a PSA about literally everything. Yeah. Yeah. Even was, if you, it, that doesn't, it's not your message to give. And yet you feel like you, you're and yet so here important. We are. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. It was, it felt really strange. I, I feel that, I feel like the places that should have done something or said something from the get go should have been those spaces that were community driven. So if you claim to be about the community, then people in the community as a whole, you're going to have black, indigenous, and people of color in that community that are being affected by this, right? Especially people in the black community specifically, right? That includes your community. So address it because this includes your community. So it felt to me that if you claim to be about the community, then you should have addressed that. Um, I'm, it went from being completely ignored to being so the pendulum swung so far that 
you know, you had lists like, um, uh, I think there was one list specifically that had black illustrators in it that had to take out all of that, like they had to shut it down because then it went from people being like, quick, we need one and just emailing everybody <laughs> for whatever project, didn't matter whether the style fit or not. It's like, that's not what this is about. And so I had friends that were being inundated. I myself got emails and I was like, what is this about? And then, or I would get a, a, an email saying, do you know any black illustrators, or et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, I'm not giving you my friends' names. <laughs> it's not yeah. happening. Like, just, yeah, because like, the caveat wow. then is not, are you the right fit? Is it good for the project? Like, right. You remove all of the qualifiers that as a, I mean, this depends on every other profession, but like as a designer, animator, illustrator, you put so much time into your craft. That should be what defines you, not what you look like. What defines your work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, it felt really icky wicky uh, looking at it and seeing go from zero to 60 in less than half a day. It was just really, yeah, icky wicky is my, my thing. Um, and then sort of seeing that swing and knowing that that pendulum was eventually gonna swing the other way again. And sure enough, it did. And so there's been very few spaces that I still see um, are, are still ongoing. Um, I myself started a few projects at that time and I, I couldn't, couldn't go through with them because just so much was going on and um, it felt like people needed to do something, right? Like we need to do something about this. And uh, I just feel like we, we just swung really wide and instead of, I, I hope that people are being more careful and being more prudent about what they share as well. And giving space to those who need space um I, I it's it's been it's been pretty wild to see certain people just be bombarded when they were already dealing with so much and now i'm being bombarded and emailed about work that doesn't necessarily fit what i'm looking for and you're not doing it for the reasons that like you don't are you respecting my work yeah no, you're checking the box because, oh, wait, it's cool to be black, hire a black person, you know? Yeah. And it's, and it's, I mean, as a Hispanic man, I used to get that all the time too. It's just like, you get asked, you get called out to be like, hey, you're that person that speaks Spanish. So that's why you're on this job. Right. And it's like, yeah, but I also animate, I also, does it, what, that doesn't matter. They're like, no, no, we just kind of need you to like translate some stuff and they're like, yeah, I've been I've I've been the token in the room many times, you mm -hmm. know. And I think this is something that I don't think gets spoken about a lot, mm -hmm. you know, being the token in the room. It's usually painful because they just have you there to see like we got one, see? Yeah. And uh but you don't really get work. And so uh this is when uh, once I started realizing that pretty early in my career, I started giving myself work and started sort of learning on my own because I wasn't going to get those um I wasn't gonna get somebody telling me sit here and learn with me, you know. If I asked a question, the reaction that I got was very different. Um, and so, since I learned that that was gonna be the reaction that I got, well, then how do I teach myself these things and how do I uh, advance myself in these ways? And so, this is when I started sort of like my online <laughs> to different tutorial uh, in the world and teach myself a lot of things because the reaction that I got even when I was in the room was very different. And so I want people to think about that. I think that it's, it's important for people to think about, especially now that you're saying we're going back to one-on-one, -on -one. Um, sit with your discomfort. Learn to sit with your discomfort. The person in front of you is not like you. So what? Maybe you'll learn something new from them. You know, they may have a different perspective. So what? But it just is. It feels really strange. It, it, it felt really strange being in that in that time, and uh, and in that space. To be really honest, and I'm glad that. Well, not glad because. <laughs> 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 but I'm 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 I, I hope my hope is that people are more mindful about why they're bringing somebody into the project of having more patience, because my my you know a lot of my um, my experience has been that the patience 
and the room for mistakes is not there if you look different or are of a different anything. Um, there's usually no room for mistake. If you make a mistake, you're not gonna get hired back. And so for me, it's been interesting to see how everything is developing. And I hope, my hope is that people continue to, um, to progress and to learn more about marginalized communities and how, how to, how to bring Hi us in. Yeah. How to highlight the voices. Yeah, how to highlight the voices rather than um, try to fit them square peg round hole. Yeah. I'm a round, 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 round <laughs> peg trying to fit in a square for a very long time. <laughs> I am round. I'm just a round. Always being round. <coughs> una bolita. I'm just always being una bolita. Yeah. <laughs> I don't fit in squares. <laughs> oh, I love it. Dorga, uh, it's been so great to have you on. Let's see if we got. Do we have uh, some questions coming in from the audience Ooh. in the chat room? Let's see who's. That's let's right. see who's out there. If building community often means just listening and responding to what people are telling you, what do you think stop leaders from list? We're missing the back half of that comment, that question. Uh, from listening and responding. Oh, from listening and what responding. What do you think stops leaders from listening and responding? <clears throat> I'm gonna just tell you again what I think and what my experience has been. And this is just Dorka saying it. A lot of times it's ego, because it's more about, I built this community and look at me. And so I find that, or like they, they're, not, they're not equipped to respond either. So when I say not equipped to respond is, for example, if I'm a person of a marginalized community, I'm in a community and somebody is being spicy, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and tell the admin that this, you know, about this person being dismissing the complaint or dismissing what people are telling you is happening as though it's nothing, this person didn't mean it, etc. It's usually the worst thing that, that you can do. It should be taken seriously. It should it should be listened to. But that's not what usually happens, you know. Um, uh, there's people who, um, yeah, it's usually ego. It's usually not being able to see past your own sort of nose. And I feel um, this is the reason why I like, I myself like to build communities with others because what I see is not what others see. I've been corrected many times myself by others from animation and be like, no, 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 that's not what you do. Oh yeah, you're right. So it's good to have different multiple perspectives. If I, I I think that's that's um, that's always key to have more than to have more than one. I don't know what makes people not listen. I wish they did, because then you'll have a healthier community. Yeah, the world will be a better place. <laughs> <laughs> How do you balance creative expression with meeting your clients' needs and expectations? How do I balance that? <laughs> That's an excellent question. That's, that's the art form right there. Um, I think it goes back to something we mentioned before of like, one for the real, one for the meal. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. One for the real, one for the meal. Yeah, I, you never heard that? I never heard that. I <laughs> no need that way. on a t-shirt ASAP. Yeah, yeah. It is, this is an expression that's been around for a long time. I definitely did not come up with mm -hmm. it. Um, it, it. Yeah, it's one for the real, one for the meal. It's just um, it's balancing out, uh, you know, knowing that this is client's work and sometimes the client is paying for it and this is what they want and when they want it. And so at some point, you're going to have to give in to the client. However, also knowing that a lot of the times, uh, you know, a lot of people, and I see a lot of people do this, is that they do whatever the client tells them to, and then on their website and on their reel, they do the version that they wanted. So it's the director's cut of what we really wanted to sure. have. Mm -hmm. And that's also another way of sort of balancing that. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, balancing it out with, um, since I'm a freelancer, just taking on work that I feel is uh, is more along the lines of like what my values align with. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I need to have. I just paid my student loans yesterday. Congratulations! <laughs> That's what's up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's, it's interesting. I always think of it as a 
I refer to it as the as you wish moment. As you wish. And I, my personal battle on that is I have a, you know, a solid 50-50 rule. Um, I will be in a project and I will always push at 100% if we have a scale, be it, the pendulum's at 100 of I give a shit about all of this mm -hmm. to the nth degree and I will work so hard on all of this <laughs> like because it's gonna be awesome. And if I get pushed back enough to the fifty percent mark, yeah, then it goes into the yeah. As you wish, man. What do you want? Yeah. You want red type on a red background, and that's the font you want. Cool. One for what? the real. Comic Sans. One for the real. Sure. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Comic Sans gets a bad rap. I'm about to piss off the entire designer <laughs> community. Oh right no, now. we have but a like, hot take. Yeah, yeah. We have a yeah. hot take yeah. coming in. Diversity is not the hot topic of today. The hot topic of today is the relevance of Comic Sans. So, Listen, I actually watched a video. It's on YouTube somewhere uh, about the man who made Comic Sans. Yeah. And it was actually really interesting of why he came up with it. And I was like, I can see that. But we'll never forget Papyrus, though. <laughs> well, yeah, Papyrus, that, I blame James Cameron mostly for that. I can't believe that that happens and happened again 10 years later, but it's okay. Oh, brown teas. Yeah, anyways. No. <sighs> but yeah, yeah we But yes, gonna... check out the, uh, the Comic Sans documentary. It's fascinating. It's, it's actually really good. What boundaries you set on gigs yeah. to prevent burnout? Well, that's a good one. Oh, Jordan, what's up? Yeah, yeah Jordan, yeah. hi. Haven't seen Jordan in so long. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've, I've only just met her on, well, met her on, uh, on social, so. Yeah. She went all the way off to Portugal and came back and I have not seen her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> miss you. But um, the bound boundaries, mm -hmm. okay. So I think boundaries are going to depend from studio to studio. I tend to set boundaries around the time that I'm going to be there and like um, try my best to work with the producers, you know, and talk to the producers and tell the producers, you know, like what is the expectation here? Is more than anything what the beginning of a project, setting up the expectations for the project. If it just so happens that the client is being a client and it is what it is, then we'll work that out somehow. Um, if I have to stay, then I have to stay. But for the most part, I try my best to anticipate and work with the producers in order to know what is what the expectation is, how, many, how long is it gonna take, what's the feasibility, what are we looking, what kind of work are we looking to do, how much this is gonna take, depending on the project and depending on, uh, but setting all of that up at the beginning of the project rather than yeah, a good producer is the make or break of 10 out of 10 projects. Yeah. Lord bless you. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, the producers out there, honestly, my heart just, if you get a good producer, it's like, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. Your, your life is a million times better as a yes, creative. Mm -hmm. absolutely. I think it's working with the producers more than anything and knowing exactly what the expectation is going to be. And as far as I've been, like, honestly, like, producers are very honest with me and be like... <laughs> This client is a client, and you may have to, okay, well, as long as I'm prepared mm -hmm. to do that, then we're good. Um, but I, I try the best to also, if I know I'm going to take on a project that is going to be a lot of, like, in intense work, um, make sure to book myself some time off after so that I can, you know, sort of recover. Because otherwise, it just becomes entirely too much yeah. if you bounce from one to the next. Yeah, you can only go a 1,000 miles an hour for three weeks and progressively less as we get older. And then you definitely need to say, I need a week of nothing. Yeah. At least I yeah. need to veg and watch Avatar The Last Airbender again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Such a good series. Yeah. And they didn't use Papyrus in their title sequence, so we like them. Yeah. <laughs> when are you gonna start your own YouTube channel? You know, that's funny. <laughs> You're like the second person to ask me that. Uh -huh, <laughs> I'm uh -huh. like, mm, maybe I should. Um, I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, what am I going to talk about? Is it going to be just me doing my... I'm doing my ceiling right now. Maybe I should I just do my DIY stuff at home. Totally good. Yeah. It's just daily vlogs. Daily vlogs. Daily vlogs. <laughs> I think my, my, my dog deserves a YouTube channel. She's got the best side eye you've ever seen it's like do you want to go go do this do you want to take a bath just that side eye of like 
Just, I know put, you, you did. Just put a GoPro on her. Yeah. That matches the side <laughs> the eye. The side eye. And so there's your YouTube channel. It's you making requests and then cut to. Yeah. Uh, do you do you want to get off of there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe someday. We'll see. Is there a moment in your career when you remember feeling super intimidated? And if so, what, who, maybe you, do you attribute to overcoming, I'm assuming? What's the rest of that? It. To overcoming it. it, yes. Is there a moment in your career when you remember feeling super? Yeah, I mean, at the beginning of my career, I was, I was a wreck every day. Like, I just, like, it was, it was hard. It was, it was very hard to, um, it was intimidating because, uh, you know, when one graduates freshly, like it's, it's sort of like, I don't know if art schools still do this, but it's my one thing about art schools that they sort of tell you that you're the one that's going to be doing everything. And it's like, no, no. And so you come in with so much pressure on yourself. Of like you have to get it right and you're doing all of this. No, you're doing just a part of the project. Like this is your part of the project. We have a sound designer. You don't have to worry about that. We have the so producer. You don't have, to, you don't have to know how to write music. Right, time. exactly. Yeah. So it's sort of like, it, it's, it, that's more, <coughs> that's what was more intimidating for me was, the idea that I was gonna have to do the whole project by myself, which is not what happens. You know, it's not the rea the realistic aspect of it. It was also a task for me to learn the programs, and so learning the programs quickly, like the, how they actually work, that was key for me. And once I started learning the tools, uh, I usually equate it to learning how to use a hammer, right? So like. If you can use your tools, then it you you the be, the more that you, you get to use your tools and know how to use your tools, the better it is for you to conceptualize the artwork that you want to do. If you know how to make it, because you know your tools well, and so for me, more than anything, overcoming sort of that intimidation was learning my craft well, learning the tools well, so that I could then, if I wanted to do something or something was in my mind to do, I was able to do it. Because at the beginning, it's very overwhelming. Do I do it in 3D? What's the best way? How to build it, etc. Learning how, from others how to, how to construct a project, how to organize it, how to ensure that you build it the correct way. Once I learned that is when I stopped being as intimidating. I think it was learning the tools more than anything. Yeah, yeah when, when you, kind of be, you feel yourself become that Swiss Army knife. Of, oh, I can walk in and there's someone's going to hand me some beautiful boards and I'm going to know how to make them move. Right. And I can focus on that being beautiful and not the video coupons on that. How do I animate a strobe flare on like the, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, video coupons. I think he made an announcement. He's coming back. I'm like, oh. I hope so. The internet needs more Andrew Kramer. Oh, yeah, yeah we miss you. But it's yeah. okay. You have like five kids now. It's good. Yeah. yeah. You, you're a little busy. <laughs> <laughs> You talked about how exploring new things and skill sets can inform your thing. Is there something you're looking to explore next? Excellent question, Jane Carroll. Um, I am currently exploring new things because I'm a very curious person. And I am currently exploring more writing. Um, I take in a few classes, a few writing classes. I will be probably taking another class in poetry uh, soon, hopefully, if I can find one. If you have any suggestions, let me know. Um, I, I like looking at creative from different perspectives. I'm also doing acrylic painting. I'm also doing just different things to kick off the creative because it felt to me at one point in my career that I was just doing motion graphics and just doing motion graphics did not fill that creative void mm -hmm. or it burned me out in one way. So I had to go to other places to express other things. So I am exploring writing and how that's informing. Um, it is also informing how I think about putting stories together, right? And how to putting uh, boards together and how to tell a story, you know? So it's always going to inform some part of your creative that you work on something creative you're also going to work on your creativity um i like to work with my hands my husband's a mechanical engineer so he likes to work with his hands the difference is that i make things pretty he uses a lot of oil and tape <laughs> engineers y'all know which one's more efficient listen <laughs> 
if you don't know the joke, it's, you know, the engineers are like, Does it, it, is it moving? Yes. Is it supposed to move? No. Put tape on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it moving? No. Is it supposed to move? Yes. Put some oil in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, that's how it goes. Okay? Is it fixed? Yeah. Is it fixed? So um, we're working on our, on our home, you know, together. Again, like how to put something physically together. It's also uh, beneficial. It, it really does. Doing things that are outside, especially physical things, I feel. Um, riding a bike, doing other things, exploring other spaces will help. And I think it's important for our industry to recognize that instead of having us be there 12 hours a day, it just give us a minute <laughs> to explore and you'll get better results. You always get better results when you give the creative time to just go and be creative. Yeah. Yes. Go look at a tree mm -hmm. for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have more questions? Yeah. You can come. Ooh, can you speak to the evolution of the name Panimation for those that don't know? Oh, sure. So um, I can speak a little bit on it. Like, you know, I think uh, we, it, it wasn't, <laughs> when, when it first started, it was called Pun Animation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which was cheeky. But it was also very much like focused on only mm -hmm. one gender. Mm -hmm. So uh, people for, from other genders that we very much wanted to be a part of the community and we appreciate you and we heard you uh, wanted the name change. They were like, I don't know about this. Like, I, I just feel really weird being in a space that I know they were comfortable there. Some of them were comfortable there, but some of them weren't. And it wasn't, you know, they just felt not great about joining a community with that name and so we it took months for uh to gather together and hear the community and understand where they were coming from and then we um yeah the name came up i remember we also gave people a chance to name it you know rename the community and we also i remember we did a, a meeting in new york uh we gathered um and to like come up with names um uh, and there was people from all, all kinds of backgrounds there um, uh, putting putting things together. And I think it was funny because the uh, the suggestion of Panimation came up way more than once in multiple spaces. And uh, it was one of the first that they thought of uh, in London as well. So we just went with uh, Panimation and we thought it was, it was a, a good idea to, um, to sort of bring people together we, we like our community we love our community and we want to ensure that people are comfortable and if this is making you uncomfortable then let's talk about it and let's see how we can help and i think a fascinating sort of piece of that story is that you founded it well it was founded with the intention of being inclusive to the excluded right and then it actually wasn't completely inclusive it really wasn't to the other side, you know, so it's like yeah. the evolution of an inclusive thing that was not intentionally exclusive. Right. And being open to saying, oh, we can do better. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And this is when I, when, you know, when somebody said about the questioning, about listening, this is what, I, what I'm talking about. Listen, like people are telling you, right? Like people are telling you like, hey, so this isn't comfortable. And guess what happened? We had a lot more people from other genders come in and, and, and be part of the community because we listened and, and we welcomed them, and, you know, ensuring that they're comfortable there. Um, I'm super happy, super happy that we listened because otherwise it would have been... Yeah, I don't, I don't like excluding people. I don't like exclusion uh, i i know exactly how it feels to be excluded from spaces so it feels again another icky wiki for me mm -hmm. Nothing to do it. <laughs> what advice would you give to individuals or organizations who are just beginning to focus on building community and diversity in the creative space, creative space? what advice would you give to individuals who are just beginning, mm -hmm. again, listen to the, to the people that are marginalized. Listen to them, include them, be, have them be a part of, because I've seen spaces where 
we're gonna build this and then no one in that build up in the top tier is actually <laughs> an marginalized, a marginalized community and it's like oh, how are you gonna build it without us right it's 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 um the best advice i can give i can give you is listen and step out of the way step out of the way just people you know I did like when we first started like I said it was like a monthly thing and then people just started coming to me hey we should do this hey we should do that hey we should do blah 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 sure oh I'm coming in I'm visiting for London let's sure come on in listen open it up uh, if you want to build a community that is about the community it needs to be an open conversation what what seems to be the the problem seems to be there it's not a problem it's just always there's always going to be a solution that people can you know come together to an agreement yeah but you have to talk about it otherwise it's just a thing have to talk about it and have to know when to up and mm -hmm. listen <laughs> very true very true uh well i think how many more do we got we're good Gorka. This was amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Yeah, we'll uh, be sure to link you on, you know, all of the fun reposts and all that. Um, everyone watching at home, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, subscribe to the channel, get notified the next time an episode drops. Uh, check out fable.app. We're building some pretty cool tools for motion design in the future. Yeah. Um, thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Yeah.